the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory forever. Today in our hearing the Holy Gospel, we found ourselves standing with our Lord Jesus Christ immediately after his transfiguration and descent from Mount Tabor. And upon rejoining the multitudes who saw him, our Lord approached, was approached by a man who brought with him his demon-possessed son. He fell to his knees and he pleaded with Jesus, saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and sore vexed. For oft times he falls into the fire and off into the water. Now in some translations of this passage, we will hear the word epileptic used to describe the boy's condition. However, it's a misleading and not accurate description. The Greek use in the Gospel of Matthew for this passage does refer to the boy as being a lunatic, that is, someone who is moonstruck. But this is not the same as epilepsy. Someone with epilepsy in those days might have certainly have been called a lunatic. The term lunatic was applied to many different ailments which included all sorts of mental illnesses. So what we should not hear in today's gospel is a misdiagnosis of a neurological disorder. If we're hearing that misdiagnosis, it's due to poor translation and not to St. Matthew's gospel. St. Mark and St. Luke also bear witness to the reality of the boy's condition, that is, spiritually oppressed by a demon. But why did St. Matthew choose the word lunatic? Well, there was an ancient belief that this type of affliction was caused by the phases of the moon. In reality, this thinking was a deception of the demons to distract mankind from humanity's true ailment of corruption and faithlessness, and the demons' desire to fool and destroy us. And faithlessness was certainly the ailment of the man who approached Christ, for though he expressed humility by his kneeling before Jesus, we see by Christ's response that the man was lacking in faith. And what's worse, he even blamed others, that is, Jesus' disciples, for his lack of faith. In other words, he wasn't there so much because he believed, he was there because he was trying out a new cure for his son. He tried the disciples, and now he was trying out Jesus. Fortunately for him, though, and his son, Christ our God is merciful, and he did cast out the demon. But before he did that, Jesus rebuked the generation who surrounded him, saying, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Now, while the disciples also lacked faith, Christ focused his rebuke on the man for placing the blame on others when it was the man's greater lack of faith that prevented his son from being healed in the first place. Jesus defended his disciples in front of the, the masses that were present, but he later rebuked them in private for their own lack of faith. And from this we should learn that if we have a good cause, we ought to first correct our brothers and sisters in private. And our own beloved St. John Chrysostom noted that only nine of the disciples were rebuked by Christ, as Peter, James, and John, whom St. Paul called the pillars of the faith, had been with Christ on Mount Tabor. But the remaining nine apostles were concerned that they had lost the grace given to them by Christ to drive out demons. And this is why they approached Jesus later and asked him privately why they were, they were not able to drive out the demons. Because of your unbelief, Jesus told them, according to St. Matthew. And he went on to say, For assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Now, <clears throat> by saying this kind, Jesus was referring to all demonic powers of darkness, not simply those that afflict us with a particular type of illness. Just like we might say mankind, or could also say angelic kind, and demonic kind. And this is how Christ was referring to the demons. But his main point was that the banishment of demons requires faith, prayer, and fasting. There's no healing, no victory in spiritual warfare without all three. Beginning with the Didache, an ancient Christian manuscript which dates the, first, the late 1st century, early 2nd century roughly, it is clear that the church fathers have taught that both the person in need of healing and the person performing the healing must believe and pray and fast. And though there is no record that an apostle literally moved a mountain, the other church fathers are clear that had they, they had this authority if the need had arisen. Furthermore, not everything the apostles accomplished was written down. But there is one peculiar story we may consider, the life of St. Mark the Anchorite of Athens, who's commemorated on April 5th. While well, speaking with Abba Serapion, St. Mark asked about the Church of Christ and whether persecutions against Christians still continued. Hearing that idol worship had ceased long ago, the saint rejoiced, and he asked, are there now in the world saints working miracles as the Lord spoke of in his gospel? If ye have faith, even as a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from that place, and it will move, and nothing shall be impossible for you. And as the saint spoke, the words uh, that, that he said to Abba Serapion, the mountain moved from its place 5,000 cubits and went towards the sea. 
And when St. Mark saw the mountain had moved, he said, I did not order you to move from your place, but I was conversing with a brother. Go back to your place. And after this, the mountain returned to its place. And Abba Serapion fell down in fright. And St. Mark took him by the hand and asked, Have you never seen miracles in your lifetime such as these? And he said, No, Father. And then St. Mark wept bitterly and said, Alas, today there are Christians in name only, but not in deeds. So now beyond the literal meaning in today's Gospel reading, this promise of the mustard seed is also an illustration of the power of faith and prayer in all areas of life. When we ask for, spirit, we ask for spiritually profitable things, as St. Theophon the Recluse said, whatever we ask without hesitation and believing God's power, we shall receive. Jesus himself said, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I go to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do it, that the Father may be glorified in the Son, and if you ask anything in my name, I will do it. So if we ask with faith in Jesus' name, truly our Lord will hear and answer our prayers. But to pray in Christ's name, remember, does not simply mean to attach the phrase, in Jesus' name we pray, amen, to the end of each prayer. Rather, to pray in his name means to pray according to his will. Just as the emissary of a king can only be said to be speaking in the name of the king, if he says what the king would want him to say, so also we can only be said to be praying in Jesus' name when we pray according to what he wants. The purpose is not to get God to do our will, but for us to learn to pray properly according to God's will. And what, what is God's will? That we might truly repent and be saved. He desires our salvation. But he will not force it upon us, and so he waits for our willing participation in the salvation and healing that he offers us. The very name of Jesus literally translates to he who is saves, or God is salvation. And this is why the archangel said to St. Joseph, She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And this is also why the holy prophet Joel and the holy apostle cry out together, Those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And this is the power of the grace of prayer given to us by Christ with the promise of salvation. The grace of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Glory to Jesus Christ. Glory forever.